Hello, everybody. This is Lucy with the ARC of Northern Virginia, and we are thrilled to be joined this morning by Dr. Polly Panitz, who's going to do our second part in a two-part series on managing challenging behaviors. So I'll let her take it away. Okay. Good morning. Thank Good you morning. for coming back sure. and for all of you guys. <laughs> Uh, remotely for being here. I have a lot of material in this presentation and I'm not going to get to it, but I purposely threw a lot of material in here that I'll refer to just so you know what it is, but it might be stuff you want to come back to. Um, and you're going to find that I'm going to race through some areas and go slowly through others, but I wanted to make sure it was in here. Um, because we're going to sort of transition from this conceptual approach to understanding um, the why behind a lot of behaviors to getting into more concrete approach. And I think of it in a sort of two-pronged way because really many of the simple maneuvers that we began to talk about last time and I'll, I'll reinforce today, um, things that strengthen your relationship um, with your child, that help you pay attention to the positive, that help your child be more successful, consistency, all those kinds of things. Very often, if you um, just have um, a child who's pushing limits and maybe going through a challenging period, that's all you need to do. But then again, many of us have challenging kids um, whose behaviors are more persistent, more disruptive, um, having more of a negative impact on his or her success and on the family, and you need more strategies. Now, obviously, I am not giving you solutions to all of your problems. I'm just presenting ideas so that you have a way to think about where do I need to go next? Because many times when you really do have a child with persistent challenging problems, you can't do this on your own, okay? So I hope to just give you ideas and resources um, and then you can move forward and press, okay. So what we talked about last time is this idea of strengthening your relationship with your child so that hopefully you can be more successful and tipping that balance um, that maybe I didn't mention, I, th I always think in terms of a balance with so much, with kids' behaviors, with our, um, our attention focused on our child, that it's this balance because we only have so much emotional energy and so much time in the day. And I'm trying to re-tip your balance so that you are spending more time on the successes, on the behaviors you want to see, um, and thereby strengthening your child's sense of efficacy um, strengthening how you make demands and strengthening your relationship with your child. So the first step, um, I had given you the assignment of spending time doing time in. Mm -hmm. Anybody have chance to do that? Yeah, do you want to make some comments? Unfortunately, it's just going to be the people here, but any comments on what it was like, how your child responded, how you felt about it, anything? I think it was good. Uh, my it was challenging to find the time. Yeah. Um, I have two others, and I had a hard time getting the other, or, and I figured I should do it with all three, and so that was hard to do and keep the other two occupied but away. Mm -hmm. um, so I had that challenge, but they all are looking forward mm -hmm. to it. And mm -hmm. I said up front, we may not be able to do it every day, right? Um, but we're going to do it as often as we can, and so they look forward to it. And, mm -hmm. So uh, was there any spillover into other times from? I, um, we were, yeah, there were times when I was, we hadn't specifically said it, that this was it, and I thought, well, this could count in <laughs> 50 minutes, or um, things just happened during the day, and I, we were having a good moment, and I tried to extend that and just the two of us. Push away your demands. Or, yes. Yeah, yeah. But did you see that there was anything that happened during that period that affected the way your child was during other times or how your interaction was? Um, I think we ha did have a better week this week. Um, we have a lot of ups and downs, so I think it's kind of too early to right. say, but I, we did have a better uh, week overall for that. Okay. Positive. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I think it is really important to say it's difficult to find the time. Mm -hmm. And isn't that telling? Mm -hmm. Right? Because That's I've lies. And it's not just because you have many children, but it's just being a family in this day and age. Um, so it's important to make an effort to do that because it can be very effective. Right? Any, any other comments from any of you? Okay, we'll move on. 
So um, the idea behind that um, is not just to think about that within the confines of your promised date with your child, but also to extend that into other times to try to make an effort to catch your child being good, right? And that's always a successful step one in attempting to manage challenging behaviors. Catch your child being good. Because what happens in our busy lives is that we pay attention to the acts of defiance or the challenges because we're busy and when everything's going okay, you're like, oh, thank goodness I can finish the dishes. I can unload the dishwasher. And you're just rushing through and not attending to it. So it's really important to note to self, I want to catch my child being good. And sometimes I say, set a challenge for yourself. I'm going to do it two times an hour or five times an hour, whatever seems appropriate. Set a challenge for yourself. Um, so that you make sure that you do it. And it can be something trivial. And sometimes I'll just say, you know, drop your pen and say, could, could you pick that up for me? And, and just acknowledge it. So, again, all you're trying to do is re-tip that balance because as you strengthen your relationship, you're going to find you're being more successful. Choosing your battles, everybody says that, right? That's pretty self-explanatory. But hopefully you've done it enough to prepare the environment so you're not always battling. We talked about going to grandparents' houses. I remember taking my kids to my father and stepmother's house, <laughs> and they insisted on leaving their fragile whatever. Uh, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I just remember these little stubs on the co glass coffee table. They insisted they would not move them. Um, and um, I just, yeah, I forget who brought that up last week. You know, you just don't spend a lot of time there. You have them over to your house um, or you're outside or choose your battle. Distractions are really helpful and especially little kids. You know you're going to enter into a confrontation. Hey, you know, rather than taking on that, no, 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 don't do that. Hey, did you see this? Let's go outside now. So if you find you're just mounting sort of tension and confrontation, let's use some animation and redirect, um, and then you can avoid, avoid a lot of confrontations. This idea of creating opportunities for compliance, that's the, you know, just little silly things that you know your child will do, but where you can reinforce compliance. Um, and it can feel good for both of you. And then we're going to be talking about this idea of creating goals together, and that's going to be a common theme throughout. Okay. Um, when you're making requests, I want you to think about when are you making the requests and how are you making a request. Uh, is your child sitting in front of their favorite screen time and you've asked them to do something really onerous and they're not paying any attention to you? Well, why, how would you? expect that they'd be compliant? Mm -hmm. Or um, are you going to ask them before they sit down, or are you going to go over and ask them nicely and respectfully, let's just put this on pause for a minute, make sure they understand what you're saying. You want to get down at their level. You want to make eye contact. You want to use very positive, affirming kind of tone, not and don't whatever again. But make it very clear what it is you want them to do, when, how long, all the specifics. Um, and humor can be really helpful. Um, again, you want to be very clear about it. It's not just clean up your room, but maybe it's I want you to make your bed and I want to make sure that such and such is in place. So very, very specific. I like, as I said last time, I like using visuals. So if you have a regular chore or a regular action you want your child to achieve, not only being verbally very specific, but having a schedule maybe with pictures for a younger child or with words for an older child, a checklist, and I'm going to give you some examples of what that might look like. Using things like timers and visual aids are really, really helpful, and teachers use them all the time for that very reason. And again, I'll give you more examples of that. Anticipation is nine-tenths of the battle. Um, and we're going to talk about this when I get to your ABC homework from last week. But hopefully you are going to become a better observer to understand what the triggers are for your child's behavior so you can anticipate when you're going to have a problem and you can plan accordingly. And that's what we're going to be talking about. But using motivators and consequences are really helpful. Okay. Um, little redundant, so I'm going to skip here. Oh, I think it just spun slowly. OK. 
Okay, I already mentioned this idea of practicing compliance, catching your child being on task. So again, you want to purposely pay attention to compliance. Um, you might be making little easy requests when your child is available, and you want to in some way acknowledge them. And this is something I want to talk about, because I've had a lot of parents who say, oh, I congratulate them, I praise them, and they hate it, and they recoil, or they get really mad at me, they explode. Not all kids can tolerate that. So if you're like celebrating with fireworks every time your child does something and you find they get really explosive or they run away from you, tone it down. And sometimes it's as calm as, I really like what you just did, or thank you, or just a little you know, blink or a, um, a thumbs up. So look at how you respond, your child responds to praise because that's just part of who they are. That, um, that focused um, tension on them might be too much or they might really crave it. So look at how your praise can motivate or demotivate your child um, and always set a positive tone. Another um, really wonderful strategy for making requests it's this idea of job talk, mm -hmm. and teachers do this again. I've learned a lot from going to teacher conferences and learning from teachers. So instead of saying, I want you to empty the dishwasher, um, you might sit down and say, okay, here are all the jobs. Say you have multiple kids. Here are the jobs. This week, your job is, is a dishwasher emptier. So you get to dinner and remember, you have the dishwasher emptier job. And so can you show me what the dishwasher emptier do, does? And as you'll see from um, what we're going to talk about later, the idea is to empower the child to have them feel very self-important and in control. We talked about how self-efficacy is so important. And that can often be a much more successful way of making a demand rather than it's, your, it's time for you to empty the dishwasher now. Um, and giving choices. So you might delegate the cards and the chores, or you might ask the kids. If you have multiple kids, that might be problematic because they might be vying for different ones. Um, but you, you might give your child at least two choices um, because that can be very powerful. Um, so planning ahead is so important. What I see is that not only do we as parents sort of ignore the successes, but we try to squeak through until we get to the point where we can't tolerate things. So what it's going to take is some time at not only analyzing your triggers, but planning ahead. So my favorite one is the grocery store. Everybody struggles with the grocery store because why does a child want to go to the grocery store? Pretty unusual, right? So um, we need to plan ahead. We need to set reasonable expectations for how a child is going to perform. And in these day and age, this day and age, do the rest of it online because it's so easy now to just order all this stuff and it shows up later that day at your doorstep. <clears throat> so be realistic about what you're expecting of your child. We talked before about temperament and how temperament is going to play into um, your expectations and plan ahead. Um, not only be specific about what you're expecting of him, like we're going to go through three aisles and I expect you to sit in the cart and at the end of each aisle, I'm going to let you pick one thing, right? Whether you're giving him choices or he's going to pick a cereal or whatever. So there's a natural positive consequence built in. You've made it very clear that he has to sit in the cart um, and that you're going to be there for three aisles. You're not going to do all 12 aisles today um, and start with success. So if you've done three aisles and you've done well, then maybe next time you can do four aisles. So depending on the developmental level of your child, you might want to have a picture schedule for exactly that. And you might want to warn them in advance. Okay, remember, here are the rules. Okay, we're going down aisle one. When we get to the end, you're going to get to. So always promising what that reinforcer is and being consistent with it. So you might, again, depending on the level of your child, you might have a direct reinforcer with each step, or you might use a point system. So you're going to get a point at the end, and then if you accumulate so many points, 
then you can accumulate that reward when you get in the car or when you get home. Again, a lot depends on your child, and we're going to talk about these kinds of token systems. Um, so, review. All kids want to be good. We're working very hard to understand who our child is. We're being very consistent. I had a parent that was facing me, okay, well, here's the way I do it, and here's the way my husband does it. Is that okay? And sometimes that really is okay. But when you're talking about a challenging behavior, you too have to come up with a consistent approach and are going to have to compromise. And that's really important. I mean, our kids... Um, benefit from different kinds of parenting styles and being able to approach parents differently for different kinds of needs. But again, when you're approaching a behavioral problem, you want to have a plan, and that's why I like writing things down because then it's written for the adults as well as for the child. We're teaching compliance. We're remembering that problem behaviors are a result of mm -hmm. lagging mm -hmm. skills, and we're going to talk more about that. Um, so in order to get to that point of figuring out what are the lagging skills, then you need to understand what are the triggers and how am I going to teach my child to be a problem solver. Because the kids that have more than just little perturbations of challenging behavior, the kids that truly have lagging skills and significant behavioral problems, they are poor problem solvers. Mm -hmm. And not only are we teaching new skills, but we're modeling for them what do you do when you face them. And this idea that I'm going to present to you today called collaborative problem solving is really a good model for your child's lifetime because when they're little, it's going to be very simplistic. <coughs> when they're older, you're going to be sitting there having negotiations about, okay, what are the problems and what's the dilemma and what are the factors here contributing and, okay, let's set some goals and then looking at your successes. And um, what kind of gift can you give your child but to be a good problem solver? As we talked about last week, resilience is really the key to success in life. It's not how successful, how high your IQ is, what your grades are, nothing. It has to do with can you approach a problem and can you create a success out of it, feel uh, efficacious, and then move on to the next problem. So um, I had mentioned last week that Problem behaviors are an opportunity to teach as parents, and it's not just the skills, but it's this whole idea of solving problems. Okay. I'm going to skip to some of this. <clears throat> so um, when you're having confrontations and emotions come into play there, um, it's not a good time to solve a problem. But using empathy to validate your child's feelings, and I mentioned this last week, when you're having a problem with your child and your child is melting down or digging their heels in, using empathy, using what's called reflective listening, I can see this is really hard for you. Or, wow, you look really mad. Um, I, I know you're working really hard at this. That can make a huge difference. It can dispel the tension and avoid an escalation. And this, unfortunately, is what I see not happening in schools. Mm -hmm. A lot of parents become really good at this, yeah. but very often in schools, they're sort of mandated by these protocols, and unfortunately, a lot of the responses to explosive kids are firm, are, are more firm and feed into the escalation. So it's really important that we have step one being one of empathy, unless, of course, somebody's well-being is in jeopardy. Um, now, this does not mean that you are entering into a whole discussion about what's going on and what's going to happen, because as we have said over and over again, when you're in the heat of the moment, nothing good happens, right? There's no problem solving that's going to happen. You are physiologically functioning at your brainstem. You've stepped on the rattlesnake, and you are off. <laughs> And you, all your <laughs> higher cortical functions are in lockdown, right? So many times using empathy, you can avoid that shutdown, but that doesn't mean, because we also all do this, and I know I have done this as a parent, in the heat of the moment, you're like, honey, what's wrong? What happened? And, oh, I'm so sorry. Or the other thing I say is, go say you're sorry. No, go fix that. What did you just do? Uh, none of that is happening. There's either going to be... Uh, an attempt to de-escalate, or if a child is escalating, you have a plan 
for what you're going to do. Are you going to walk away? Is the child going someplace? Are you removing everything from the space and just letting your child sort of get it out of their system and when they've calmed down, you can move on, okay? The other thing I see very often happening is not only a confrontation when a child's at this point, but an insistence that a child repairs. Go say you're sorry. Very few people with emotional regulation issues that get very explosive can go apologize. And if they do, it's meaningless. Yeah. So let them repair it later. And we all do that. Go say you're sorry. Go tell your teacher, blah, 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 blah. Um, manners are one thing, but in the heat of the moment, none of that works. And it usually just ends, ends up being another control battle that we're having with the child. Huh. Learn to listen. Yeah, we do that all right because it's so ingrained in our culture. It's, and, and the other thing is when you see your child do something that looks um, so unkind, um, or embarrassing if you're out in public, you want them to repair, but it's really not appropriate for a child um, in that, in the heat of that. And, and it just sounds fake because my daughter was like, oh, I'm sorry, no. Exactly. You know, it's like, okay, I know you don't mean it, like, but she knows right. that she's supposed to say it. Right. It's sort of like I see a lot of parents right. wanting to teach kids please at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And if you have a typically developing child, you know, sure, you can throw that in. But if you're a child where, a child where you're trying to teach basic communication, leave the please out. It's not a functional word. It doesn't mean anything to them. It's just like a, okay, I'll say please. And then what happens is they say please for everything, right? Please, 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 please. It just means give me. Um, so, you know, there's one thing about being a good citizen and being empathetic and those kinds of things, but that, those aren't the best ways to teach them. So we want to understand how a child feels, and we also want to make sure our child knows how to ask for help. Very often when I'm seeing a child, that's like the first thing they need to do, whether it's a child on a communication device mm -hmm. or a child with a lot of language. Sometimes they just need to know how to ask for help or a break. Right? So think about that. Maybe they just need a break and they don't know how to ask for it. Um, or they're totally overwhelmed because they don't know how to ask for help. So we want to avoid threats and we want to avoid power struggles. So might um, reigning over this kind of tension does not solve any problems. It might quell it, it might put it away, but it's not teaching your child skills, certainly not strengthening the relationship you have with your child. Three, no, review. Um, okay, so I asked you guys to make observations um, about your child's challenging behavior. I don't know if this was relevant or if any of you guys got to it. This idea, so in the schools they call them functional behavioral assessments, FBAs, right? Um, and that's just the school's name for them. For the rest of us regular people, we're looking at what are the antecedents, the A, what led up to the child's behavior, what is the behavior, and I think I mentioned this before, you want to be very objective in describing what is the behavior. It's not, my child is so ADHD that he can't do blah, 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 blah. That doesn't help me because I don't know if your child is ADHD, and besides, even if he's been diagnosed with ADHD, that doesn't tell me what the behaviors are. That doesn't help me understand them, right? So you want to say, He's so impulsive, he's always touching things and getting too close to people, right? And that um, gives me a better understanding of what the behavior actually is. And the other thing about using these labels, medical labels, educational labels, whatever, what I see happen in all settings with professionals is that we're all busy and sometimes we as professionals respond to those labels without truly taking the history to understand the behaviors. So I've seen kids suddenly being dealt with as if they have OCD or ADHD mm -hmm. or, okay, well, then we better send them off for medication or we better do this and that, and who knows? Mm -hmm. Who knows? So it doesn't help you. So try, and when you're talking with people about your kids, make sure we're all describing the behavior that you see. It takes a lot of time. Teaching is skills. Okay, so I wanted to give you, oh, but let's talk about the ABCs. Anybody want to share? Yeah. So um, well, I went with my toddler to visit my parents for breakfast. I took two. Two, right? yeah, three four and, and a half and three. Uh -huh. And uh, 
So then in the morning for breakfast, like, I think my daughter had a meltdown over a toy or something, and mm-hmm. so she just wouldn't stop. And so I didn't want to destroy the breakfast for the rest of the family, so I just took her away, went up to uh, one of the bedrooms, and then I just let her cry, and she just and I just sat with her, and I didn't say anything, because I'm like, it's not going to make any difference if I try to talk to her now, because she's just in a screaming match. So I just sat there for like 10 minutes with her, and then finally she just like came down, just put her head on my lap, and she's like, Mom, I'm tired, I just want to go to sleep, because she went to bed late the night before, and I'm like, oh, it's like... There's your A. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's one of your antecedents. Mm-hmm. She had a rough night, yeah. so... Mm. And so then so you like were more accepting exactly. of the behavior. So then I was like, okay, well then you can sleep. But then the other, the little one came, and so then that didn't happen. But for me, it, like, it, like I understood, like, oh, this is what it is. Like, you know, there's something that's behind it. It's not the toy. It's that mm-hmm. she's tired, and like this is just it's overwhelming for her. And you're going to grandma's, mm-hmm. and there was a toy. Whose toy was it? Grandma's toy. Yeah, I was like, yeah, the toy that they have for them. Uh-huh. So. So she was struggling with her brother over yeah, the yeah, sibling sister. over. So over the toy, yeah. So it helped you think about what led up to it, mm-hmm. exactly. Because I'm like trying to think. I'm like, what, like, what's causing this? I'm like, you know, she just woke up. It's early in the day. Like, why is she having a meltdown? And I realized, I'm like, oh, she's just tired. So okay, it made me so, it made me realize, like, oh, like this is what happened before, and this is what's, you know, this is why. And I'm really glad you brought that up because I'm actually not addressing this in in this talk, but very often. What my job becomes is dealing with basic aspects of everyday life, Mm -hmm. like sleep, like dental Mm -hmm. hygiene. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes kids actually have toothaches. Mm -hmm. Um, Like constipation Mm -hmm. is huge. huge. How many kids do we all see that have constipation issues and that is contributing to their sleep issues, Mm -hmm. to their Mm -hmm. overall irritability? Mm -hmm. Or today I'm really plugged up Mm -hmm. and I'm more irritable. So sometimes it's it's true. (laughs) A knowing giggle. Um, But it's amazing how these Mm -hmm. fundamental daily actions can really impact. So so go through your mental allergies for coming to spring. Mm -hmm. And there's all this research now about allergies being an underlying contributor to behavior. Interesting. So this is something that actually happened when my son was much younger. Um, but it, to me, it was really, um, it, it proved the value of doing that type of, of assessment. Uh, when he was in preschool and he was very, um, lacked verbal skills or just had a few words, he would routinely um, pinch or hit uh, another kid in the, in the classroom. And we were trying to figure out why. And then we're, we're really getting down, okay, what happened just before and, and whatever. Well, what it turned out after um, really looking at it for a few days, there was another child in the classroom who cried every day. Mm-hmm. And when he cried, it upset my son, and the way he expressed his upset was that he would pinch or hit another child. And um, But we wouldn't have been able to figure that out if somebody hadn't been keeping track of that data. <clears throat> and then they were able to address both the, the crying Huge. child and the other yeah. one. But it, it, was, it was like an epiphany for me as a parent. Yeah. So in the school, you're not there. We're not there. Mm-hmm. Or maybe we're there, but we're not actually putting mm-hmm. ourselves in the child's mm-hmm. place. And I, I went to a wonderful lecture on executive functioning, and she um, had a video at the child's level, at this mm-hmm. chi- particular mm-hmm. child's desk, mm-hmm. um, to to give us a view of what this child was seeing every day. Mm-hmm. And there was a window, and over here was a hamster with a wheel. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and no, literally the camera's like scanning uh-huh. from one tractor uh-huh. to another. Uh-huh. And then there's all this stuff on the walls, and y- the camera's going, uh, 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 uh-huh. and here's the nice. teacher up front. So thinking about the child's environment, who's mm-hmm. sitting next to him, mm-hmm. and then of course in special ed settings, or not even necessarily. Um, but if there's a special needs child who has um, some behaviors that might be toxic to anybody mm-hmm. for sensory mm-hmm. reasons, or mm-hmm. our child might be mimicking mm-hmm. that child, oh, yes. mm-hmm. you get yeah. that a lot. Yeah. Let, let me try that on and mm-hmm. see if it works. Mm-hmm. Um, so thinking about everything in the environment, mm-hmm. what happened the night before, and and, and what this child's experience mm-hmm. is during the day. Or just the other thing I see in typically de- developing kids, 
especially like kindergarten level, mm -hmm. I am just so beat. So be it. I am working so hard right. to hold it together right. and be the good child and pay attention and perform mm. and make friends and blah, 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 blah. And then at the end of the day, they fall apart. And also many times it's too uh, distracting in the lunchroom and they can't eat their lunch. lunch so by the afternoon, not only are they tired, but their blood sugar is low. Oh. Yeah, they don't eat. I have a lot oh. of kids who don't eat yeah. because there's so much going on at yeah. cafeteria. It's <laughs> Dreadful place. <laughs> yeah. So, any other comments about the ABC? Maria? Okay. So, yeah. so I have two things that I think is extremely interesting. One is that I went through this throughout the week, and I just came up with two behaviors that I I feel like these are the two things that embrace everything. And then you're talking about um, you were talking about getting too close to another person. I'm like, oh, I have the same thing, but I don't see it as a problem. So, part one, I think I'm a very relaxed parent, which probably doesn't help my child. Um, so part two is what I saw in my kid, and um, I saw two behaviors. One is the antecedent is food is close to time to eat, or, or this, he's close to the kitchen, or, or my husband is eating and he's, he already ate. So anything around food drives him crazy, and he has hyperphagia problems, etc. So that's the antecedent, time to he eat, time to, to cook. Eat. He wants to eat. Yeah. Um, so, so what does he do? That's the behavior. He may scream. He may start you know, going like this, I mean, a lot of stuff. He will not follow directions. He can't control himself. Consequences. It really depends how tired we are. But I try to ask him to, okay, breathe. And we do something that I've seen in an Elmo movie. Mm. Breathe, Camilla, breathe. Go sit down, breathe. Um, ask him to help cook, like, chop, and that really helps him. But then the chopping has to be cooked, too. So. So um, <laughs> I mean, it's always that way the visual, but you have to remind him, look at the red, it's coming. So I think it's like all of that together sometimes helps him wait the 10 minutes until he's ready, bring the plate or so. But if you want to remove him from that place, it's not going to happen. So we have to plan better. I would just listen to... All right, so back. for Camille, um, he doesn't know the difference between dinner's coming in a minute versus 10 minutes versus yes. two hours, no. right? right? So no. for him, I need it right now. Yes. Mm -hmm. So a timer might be really helpful. We, a we, visual we do timer. it. And, yeah. and it's, it's just a reminder. Look at the timer. It's red, and it keeps going. Yeah, like right. That. The time timer. Yeah. Right. So I think it's a combination that helps us go through each of that. A lot of planning. I need to have something ready so the other part is quick. Yeah. yeah. And the last thing you want to do is give them something to eat before that before. time. Because I don't do that. Then you become a part of the problem. And he eats more, and he is over, right. like in the limit to be overweight. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so the other antecedent is, the other is like, when he's extremely hyper, which happens usually at the end of the day, or in, um, if it's a weekend, it could be at any time of the day, and he wants attention. So I think that's the antecedent. He wants attention. Why? I don't really know. He's an only child. He has two parents that love to play. So I think a lot of issues. Um, so the behavior is like, I'm going to grab anything I know is going to grab, get their attention, and I'm going to run away, and I'm going to make sure they see it. Mommy! Or takes a button, button from his shirt. Mommy! And then he runs with the button in his mouth and mm. so many things you're like it's almost impossible not to do anything so I've been trying like a list of things and again he has to do a lot, do a lot with am I tired is it too dangerous so um, um, ignore is the number one and number two is replace hey let's go do this it works sometimes sometimes it doesn't work if it is too dangerous I do try to stop him and say like you have to stop now or give me this now but I do try that like at the third or fourth option um, other times it's um, I think those are the ones I wrote. Uh, let's see. Ignore, right, redirect, stop. And the number four is when it's really too much, we may get angry and we try to stop that. But, you know, it does happen. And he, of course, he's achieving as an adult, but it does happen. Well, yeah. we're all tired in the evening, and you have a <laughs> yeah. lot on your agenda, and you're worried about getting him to bed on time and checking everything off your list. So, so we try that list, and I feel like at least it gives me a little bit more patience to know, like, oh, he just wants attention. So let's try to do very direct. Let's look at the book, and it's working better every day. Yeah. But, but you know, those are the two major things that are very consistent with my child. Yeah. And the other ones, I'm sure there's a lot that another person will see. And, again, as I said, I don't see them as problems. I just see it like an everyday personality, and I'm okay yeah. with that. Yeah, and it might also be for yeah. personal culture. You know, some people right. don't mind. Yeah people getting close and other people do. I think where 
a country and a culture in general that likes that personal space. Yeah. And I don't know about how you no, were raised, no, but no, other no, cultures, no, it's like yeah. all of right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. them. Yeah. So um, maybe we'll get back to your evening issue and, and we can use some of our skills because that's a typical time for for working parents, any kind of parents, to, for things to fall apart because we're tired and because there's a lot on your plate. Mm -hmm. And how can you anticipate? And, and a, a simple way would be to first do something really fun with him to give him that attention and then to to maybe plan for an activity that you know he loves that he can do on his own and then have a reinforcement where you're going to then focus a lot of attention on him, which is probably bedtime kind of thing. Um, but just knowing those patterns is really a big part of the battle and it, it gets you off the hook, right? Then you yeah. suddenly understand them and it, it feels a little better. Um, oh, so the case example I first wanted to give you it's very slow processing. <laughs> um, I have a whole bunch of, of cases that I made up that I want to throw in as we're talking, and the other ones are based on the questions from the okay. people at home. Um, so here's one that I came up with, is let's create this child B, who is an elementary age child who really struggles with writing, which is such a common problem yeah. to struggle with. Writing is a very complex task. Um, and she um, argues with her parents whenever there's a written assignment. She um, it takes her a long time to create her work. It's really messy. She gives the absolute minimum effort. So if the teacher says five sentences, mm -hmm. she has five sentences with three words, and that's it. And um, and this is a real issue because we're trying to elaborate on her writing um, production. So um, she has this wonderful teacher who gets her and knows how to engage her and is giving her shortened, expecta shortened assignments, right? So we're lowering the expectation, maybe not, maybe below grade level to the point at which this child can be successful. And then once we build on her confidence, we can start increasing the demands and be very specific about what we're teaching her, because I don't know if this has to do with a fine motor issue or organizing her thoughts. It could be many different things. Um, they've worked on the child asking for help. Thank you very much. Um, she has a secret signal for that because for many kids raising their hand and saying, help, I'm lost, they don't want to do that. That's like social suicide, right? Mm -hmm. So you need some <laughs> kind of flipping the card over or some sort of secret code with the teacher, come help me. Um, and the teacher's also using some nice accommodations, combining some dictating with other strategies so that this child can realize her cognitive potential but not be so bogged down by the writing process. So she's doing really well. And then there's a substitute teacher, and this happens. This is life. Substitute teacher comes in. This is not in this child's IEP, whatever her teacher mm -hmm. is doing. And this is when I always say to parents, make sure it's in the IEP mm -hmm. um, because your teacher might be out on maternity leave, not just one day of illness, or there might be turnover, or next year you have a brand new teacher. But anyway, we have a substitute teacher who gives a regular assignment and expects this child to perform like any other child. And what does she do? She's an emotionally reactive child. She says, I can't do it. And the teacher says, I'm sorry, but this is what I've asked of you. I need you to do it. And now the teacher realizes she has to follow through with her demand, right? Mm -hmm. So she's starting to dig her heels in. And what does she get from the child? But attitude, right? I don't know what she said, but a hand on the hip, and no way am I doing that. And she sends her off to the principal because she's a substitute. She's got her hands full. It turns out the principal's having a bad day also. And, um, and maybe doesn't know this child or doesn't know um, what's a good way to handle her, and he uses a threatening approach with this child. And you gotta get your act together. This is what third graders do. This happens, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this could be a fantastic AP or a principal, um, but what does the child do but escalate? Because this is her third point. And she does the one thing that pushes this principal's button. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's words or throwing things or attitude or, um, um, threatened, um, but the principal sends his child home. So here's this example of how the right kinds of accommodations in a child's environment and how we're working with a child can really make a difference. Um, and, but you know, this kind of stuff happens. <clears throat> okay, 
So now I'm going to talk about what I referred to last time as these areas of lagging cognitive skills when we're talking about kids that truly have regular behavioral challenges and the school is looking at how are we going to deal with it, you as parents have this occurring on a regular basis, we really need to address what could be these underlying areas of delay that we need to address by teaching new skills, right? So this is not your typically developing child who just acts out over a toy today because she's a little tired or has this kind of issue here or there. These are the kids who are having regular behavioral challenges. And we're looking at um, what are these areas of lagging skills. So I don't want to go too much into detail because I'm not, we're not addressing, um, we're not solving all your problems. But just to give you some ideas of what are executive function skills, this is a very popular term now. Everybody has executive function difficulties. Um, but these are our abilities. These are abilities that mostly reside in our prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that is maturing over the first 30 years of your life, right? And it regulates all your other higher cortical functions. And this is our ability to keep track of our thoughts and our actions. Our thoughts our actions and our things, right? Um, in the school, there's this concept that everyone talks about, your working memory, your ability to hold on to actively material that is being taught in a lesson or that's in the paragraph you're reading or in the math problem that you're solving. So you're actively, it's not short-term, long-term, it's just active working memory. And kids that really struggle and the stereotypical kid with executive function challenges is your kid with ADHD, attention deficit disorder, hyperactivity, really struggle with working memory. Um, and you can imagine that that makes classroom environment very challenging because what did you say? Oh, I forgot that first thing. And you get to the answer and you forgot the, the first item that was presented and so you, you really struggle. You struggle with organization and planning. You struggle with many of these individuals, uh, adults as well, can struggle with very rigid thinking. I, this is what I want to do. I can only think about this. Don't ask me to do something else. I'm not a multitasker, and transitions are really challenging for me. Or these individuals might have a hard time getting started, just sort of jump-starting into how do I approach this, and how do I organize myself so that I can respond to task number one. These individuals also make a lot of mistakes, and they have a hard time monitoring the quality of the work that they are producing. Um, so, many of these people don't complete tasks, lose things, um, maybe accomplish their homework and then they can't find it or they forget to turn it in. I have one child I'm working with right now, he's totally intending to hand everything in and his parents are super organized, so he pulls it out, he knows he has to hand it in, and then it takes him forever to figure out where this goes and where that goes and where's my stuff and how do I get to the desk. So, by the time he's done all that, He's like five minutes into the lesson and he's lost mm -hmm. the instruction. Mm -hmm. So that teacher needs to streamline all the mm -hmm. functions for that child because he just can't handle step A, B, C, D. It seems so simple to us, mm -hmm. too much for this child. Um, these kids lose their materials. You open their desk and they're like alive. They explode <laughs> out of you. They're fidgety. They knock things over. They're always moving. They're always chewing. They're always touching. They're in your face. Um, a lot of them sort of act out because they're getting a lot of negative feedback from the environment, so they want to be, they want to get attention, so they tend to be silly or chatty or disruptive. Um, they can be hyperactive in terms of talking, mm -hmm. little verbal diarrhea. Um, they seem to not listen when they're spoken to. They're not necessarily defiant, but they've got something in their mind they're thinking about or they're distracted by that fire detector, and I wonder how that works, and is it going to go off? Um, so it's not necessarily defiance. Again, you can go to an IEP meeting and everyone's talking about defiance, but it's just this child is so distractible or really into smoke fire detectors. Um, so um, understanding that this is really an executive function challenge. Um, and these kids, interestingly, have really poor self-awareness. Mm -hmm. So they don't recognize that they're doing all this. And when I see kids with ADHD and we're talking about medication and we're giving the medication and the parents always say, so, you know, is it helping you? Most of these kids don't recognize that it's helping them, that they're having these 
troubled. They realize that their grades aren't good, they're getting into trouble, no one's asking them to play. They realize the ramifications, but they have very, very poor self-awareness. And Russell Barkley, who's big in this area, mm -hmm. talks about that being a very key feature of these kids who struggle in these areas. Oh, thanks. So what do you do? Okay, we have behavioral challenges as a result of executive dysfunction, then we need to teach the skills. It might be organization. And again, I'm going to skip through these, but if these are relevant to you, you'll have them. Um, you might need to teach transitions because they're rigid thinkers. So you might have a visual for first you do this, and then you do that, which means you do what I want you to do, the non-preferred, then you get the preferred. Right? Mm -hmm. So these kids need to realize that transitions lead to good things rather than digging in. So you need to motivate them to get over that and have positive associations. You might use a visual schedule just to give you some visuals, good visuals. And I think I've given you some good resources in the back. I, um, there are a million resources for visual schedules. Um, mm -hmm. Linda Hodgkin is one that I use a lot. And she's got a great newsletter and website. Um, you might use a visual schedule or an older child. You might either have a checklist, or I love this idea of a photo, because mm -hmm. you look at it and you immediately know what I need to do without mm -hmm. having to process mm -hmm. all this language and check off all these steps. So this is what it looks like to get ready. I have my lunch box, I have my sweatshirt, because it might get chilly, I have this, that, my hair's combed, whatever. And that might be attached to each bag that a child has. And you might have, oh, there you are. You might have the box by the door and the systems in the backpack and the colored folders and so on. So this might be a lesson you would give at a preschool level for a child with executive dysfunction. Okay, I'm not going to sit there. I go in classrooms all the time and teachers talk for five minutes about all the steps involved. Well, give me a visual. Yeah. This mm -hmm. is what we're creating, this mousse, right? The yellow is these are all the materials I need. The green is the to-do, the steps involved. And the red is the end point. And you could translate this into any level, developmental level. So this might be that same yellow, green, red zone approach to doing your homework. So you have it all organized. Here's your action green section. Um, here's your yellow section. You might underline all the assignments so you make sure you know the key words involved in the instructions and maybe even number them. Mm -hmm. um, you have all of your materials right here ready. Here's where I'm going to actually work and accomplish those steps. And then where does it go? Just because you finished it doesn't mean that you're going to hand them in. You're going to find it, the finished work, and hand it in. So then you need an organizational system right in the backpack. Everything goes in a bucket by the front door, and all that stuff is done. It's the other thing I see a lot of, these kids who are terribly disorganized, they lie in bed and they go, oh, my gosh, I forgot my blah, 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 and they pop out of bed, or what's going to happen tomorrow? No, you've done it all. You have your checklist. Everything's all organized in that bucket by the front door. Your coat's there. Everything is ready. And um, hopefully you can get in bed and do what you need to be doing. Okay, next area, language processing. Pretty obvious. Um, these are kids that have difficulty with language, not necessarily language delay, but I have a lot of kids who just don't have emotional language for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. It's not intuitive. It's not a family that teaches that. Um, and therefore, they don't have the language to identify how I'm feeling and to be able to mm -hmm. talk about it. So maybe we need to teach them that. Um, and not just on cards, but in real life. So a lot of times we teach them pictures of emotions, but we have to apply that. Mm -hmm. So walk around saying, did you just notice what happened with that little child? Why do you think he's feeling that way? What would you call what you saw? Mm -hmm. um, so you can examples in your life or, or watching movies, YouTube videos, reading bears, seeing bears, what, whatever material you can find <coughs> for the child, really give them this language to help them be able to digest what they're feeling and what they're observing and the interactions they're having with others. So these kids might look non-compliant, um, not follow through, not being able to process what's happening with language, which is our end goal here is we don't want to just see behaviors. We want to be able to work these things through mm -hmm. because if we can teach our children to work through, then they're going to be much more independent and doing this on their own. 
We don't want to always be involved in doing this. So we're teaching them the skills now. Many of these kids can have challenging behaviors. The next area that is so key, and many of these areas obviously can overlap, but it's emotional regulation. And this is above and beyond what you might see in temperament, mm -hmm. um, although it's a part of temperament because some of us are um, vibrating. Some of us are um, are more emotionally reactive than others, but um, some kids really are very explosive, and it can happen very, very quickly. And we need to approach that head on. Um, so this is being able to separate affect from behavior. This is being able to control your emotional state, so have some strat strategies for self-soothing. And in fact, many of these kids, I always ask about um, birth history, and many of these kids just come out irritable. These are kids that are difficult to soothe. You're walking them back and forth. They're maybe having erratic schedules um, and have been like this from, from day one. So obviously, if you're emotionally reactive, it interferes with your ability to problem solve. Mm -hmm. And we need to address the emotional regulation piece to ever be able to get to problem solving. So what do they look like? Anything. Strong emotions, right? There you go. <laughs> okay. Oh, you yes. um, They might have extreme tantrums. They might quickly swing from zero to 60. It might take them a long time to recover. They have a difficult time learning from their mistakes. These kids might be aggressive. And these kids that are emotionally really reactive, and we can ask George, they say provocative things. They love to say, I'm going to kill you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I want to be dead. Does that mean they're homicidal or suicidal? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. I mean, you've got to distinguish, but not necessarily. They just have really intense feelings. And those statements always get around to other people. Um, but we see that a lot. I mean, hopefully it starts with something like, I hate you, or I'm so dumb. Um, and these kids can't really talk about their feelings. Uh, and unfortunately, this is true not only with kids with emotional regulation, but really kids with a lot of challenging behaviors, they get labeled by their peers. So many of these kids are very socially isolated. And mm -hmm. I know I always struggle to sort that out. Is it primary or secondary? Um, and you know, it's sort of all of the above. It's, but, but peers don't like kids that, that react. They don't trust them. Um, they don't want to be associated with them, and um, and then those kids sort of get labeled, and it's difficult to recover from that, which is very painful as a parent. We're both tapping. Ah. So many times, as you're addressing explosive kids, um, you not only want to think about what are we doing when we're making demands. Um, and how can we help this child be successful, but there has to be a plan for teaching this child how to self-soothe. So whether it's at bedtime or whether it's having, um, helping a child to de-escalate as they're escalating, um, this is really an important part of your plan. So we talked a little bit before about as your child has mounting, mounting escalations, you might distract, you might redirect, you might use empathy, sometimes just your presence as long as you're not part of the problem. But for a teacher, very often, physical proximity without actually being involved, but just being close, I mean, knowing that there's somebody who's got your back mm -hmm. can be really helpful. Um, and um, this idea, again, from schools, walk, don't talk. Mm -hmm. So um, I've said this over and over again. This is not a time where you are talking to a child and try to figure out how did we get there and what are we going to do and how are you feeling and how are we going to repair this. Um, we're taking the child someplace to keep everybody safe and to have the child de-escalate. So very often we're just moving, but we are not having a discussion because the discussion is likely to cause further escalation. So at home, think about that, um, because we all, by reflex, want to try to solve the problem when a child's escalating, and um, it's, it's rarely helpful. Validating the feelings, as I said earlier, can, can de-escalate very often. I can see this is really tough for you, um, especially if that's in lieu of a further confrontation or um, 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 uh, some kind of punishing statement. If a child really is escalating and isn't truly acting out, finding a distraction such as making this, giving this child a job, 
Mm -hmm. um, oh, could you run this to the office, or could you go? I had one kid. He was the light turner on or mm -hmm. off. Our mm -hmm. <laughs> so she was always asking him, oh, time to turn the light off. And that was so helpful for the child because he needed to move around, and it distracted him from whatever um, uh, situation he was, he was getting into. And the teaching self-calming techniques mm -hmm. are really helpful for all of our kids. And sometimes you really need to teach this in a very um, – uh, purposeful way and practice it. So you can't just set up a paradigm. You need to practice it. You need to maybe use it every day. Maybe you as a parent are teaching this every day at a certain time. We're all practicing it together and then we're talking about when we're going to use this. Mm -hmm. And again, having visuals for all of this. If you look at the zones of regulation, which is a wonderful curriculum for kids that are learning to self-regulate, there's some great visuals. There's one vis uh, figure eight that child can trace, either literally trace with their finger or just have a visualization of tracing as they're breathing because with a little kid to ask them to count as it's moving in and out. With a slightly older child, they can have something on their abdomen, watch it move up and down, or they can just focus on the number of breaths or just a squeeze. It, it really varies with your child. It might be imagery. It might be pretending you're lying on the beach and you're tensing and relaxing individual muscles. It really depends on the context, your child's developmental level. But whatever it is, it's something that you're recommending and not just every time you get mad, I want you to breathe. It's we're going to practice it. This is exactly what it looks like. Here's the visual for it, and this is when we're going to use it. And we're going to do this together, and I'm going to model for you how I use it too. So it has to be very purposeful um, teaching of a skill um, and then applying it and having it in the IEP or having everybody know this is something that we do. This is not a timeout. This is not a punishment. Right. Right. This is something we are teaching a child and we are going to um, uh, celebrate if a child uses because this is a child taking responsibility. You might need to be involved initially in pointing out I see that you're getting to that point. What do you think you need to do? Can you, do you think you can hold it together? Or do you think you need to take a break? So you might be prompting the child initially. As you move along and the child gets older, hopefully um, they're going to learn to self-recognize and we have that system in place, right? We're flipping the card. I need my time out or I need to go to my special place. Um, because in schools, the kids need a special place to go. If it's that child next to them that's triggering them, it needs to be out of the room. Um, they don't want to be ridiculed or observed by their peers, so they want to go out of the room and have a safe place to go, so that might be, need to be written into their IEP or some plan with the school. Can I just make a brief comment? Yeah, sure. Um, identifying um, and reflecting, the, validating the feeling that you see. Sometimes if the meltdown is due to a tantrum, like they want something, um, that a lot of times the best thing to do is validate what they're asking for so that they know that you've heard because usually they think like you're not listening to them. And so it's like, yes, I know you want this and I'm going to try to help you. And I've seen kids drop right out of a meltdown for that. Yeah. Um, and yeah. even though the ultimate answer is no. No. It gets them. It but if you respond with the no, you're going to escalate. The child's going to escalate. But if your child is always asking for the cookie, right, mm -hmm. their cookie, you could say, gosh, I know you love cookies. And then what I recommend to parents is if cookies are a frequent trigger mm -hmm. or food is a frequent trigger, then you have these hard, fast rules. And the child knows the hard, fast rules. So then you say, Johnny, I know you love cookies. But what's our rule about cookies? I forget. When do we have cookies? When's the next time you're going to get to have a cookie? Okay, let's look at that. And this is assuming that they're not, like, on the floor yelling and screaming. Right? They're still logical <laughs> so that you can walk it through. Right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thanks for, for saying that. So, so acknowledging um, not just how they're feeling but why they're feeling that way and affirming it. Yeah, I mean, I love cookies, too. I dream about cookies sometimes. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's okay. What's that? <laughs> Are you making fun of me? No, no, I'm making fun of me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the last area, I think it's the last area, is cognitive flexibility, kids that are really literal and concrete and have a difficult time shifting, especially if they don't want to. 
Um, these are kids who tend to focus on details. You know, these are kids who see the trees, they don't see the forest, um, who need predictability, struggle with novelty, um, and need to control, right? These are kids, in extreme cases, who really have a hard time with play and joining in with other kids because they want to follow the rules. They're always telling everybody what the rules are. They're reporting their friends for not following the rules because we all break the rules all the time. And we all have all these gray zones for rules that we don't even think about. I always use the example of driving down the highway. It says 55. Who drives 55, right? But these kids, you know, they'll say, Mom, you're driving 60, and it says 55. And they do that all day long in school. Um, and we all violate all the time, and it just drives them crazy. Could yeah. you expand on that, please? Do they do it on purpose? I'm talking about more like teenagers. They know the knowing. Do they do it on purpose? Do they do they catch themselves doing it or not? What? Being annoying. Like, hey, you have a typo here. And I'm like, you know, this kind of things. Like being so... No, but... but Depends. Kids, yeah. Depends. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Um, so if it's this kind of child who is very literal, a rule follower, rigid, um, yeah, I've seen a lot of these kids in school. They're constantly calling out the teacher and their peers, and that is really annoying, right? It's really annoying to everyone around mm -hmm. them, and they are constantly agitated because nobody's following the rules. Mm -hmm. And they think, I mean, these are great kids to parent because they're always following the rule. You say it's bedtime, and they, they go to bed. But um, the problem <laughs> is the real fluid social world, dynamic social world, we don't follow the rules all the time. We're always bending them. And I always go, if you guys haven't read Tem Temple Grandin's, I think it's thinking in pictures in the back, she has all these lists. She figured out when she was older, right, she's a big spokeswoman for autism, and she figured out as she got older, these are the rules that never bend, and these are all the gray zone rules. And she has all these lists, wow. Wow. and that's how she learned to cope with the social world, is by creating, these are ones that can be bent a little bit. These are bent a lot, and these are the ones, oh, can't bend at all. What's her name? Temple Grandin. Yeah. So we don't think about that because we just figure it out. We pick up on cues around us. Okay, so these kids struggle with transitions. We get that a lot. Little preschoolers transition. They want the sameness. They ask a lot of questions. What's going to happen next? They don't tolerate it when the substitution comes in. They sneak in one extra errand. Um, they're avoidant of new experiences. People, they can be very obsessive very anxious because this kind of rigidity can lead to anxiety. I don't know what's going to happen next and if I can deal with it um, because nothing is totally predictable enough for these kids. Um, oh, I did have one more category. Um, and I, I, I didn't give you specific strategies with these rigid kids because we're going to talk about that later. So the kids that are lacking in awareness of how their behavior affects other people, they can also present with challenging behavior because they just don't have that feedback loop of, okay, this is not meeting a social norm, or okay, this is really irritating to that person. They might recognize that it's irritating and still do it for another reason, but the kids that really struggle with social thinking, they don't even recognize it because all they're thinking about is their own needs, right? So they haven't developed that theory of mind, that ability to put themselves in other people's shoes and recognize that other people have their own feelings and reactions independent of them. Um, so they might seem lacking in empathy. Um, they might seek attention in inappropriate ways. They don't pick up on nonverbals. They don't understand the difference between good job and good job, mm -hmm. right? So to, hit, to them, it might just be the words, good job. And there's a lot of sarcasm in elementary school. And, um, they might lack basic skills. So they're not necessarily autistic, but they might have some weaknesses in this area. So these might be kids that invade personal space. Now, there are lots of reasons why you might invade personal space, but this might be one reason. They may say hurtful things because to them it's the truth. You know, your hair looks terrible today. <laughs> oh, wow, that's a really lousy haircut, right? So um, to them, they're not being hurtful. It's just to them, that's the truth. You know, what's wrong? <laughs> I get this all the time. A kid in the office yesterday, she just could not get off this. Her mom had one little hair in her 
mustache area, and she just was all over that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that That's why that was <laughs> that why that was. I mean, her mother was giggling, and she was very funny about it. But we had a whole discussion because this child was older about why that was not an appropriate thing to be bringing to our appointment, <laughs> and where she could share that with her mom and how her mom felt about her doing that and how she would feel if I said, oh, look at that pimple on your face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, she wasn't trying to get attention and she wasn't being defiant. It's just that her mother had a hair in her, under her nose and to her it was not acceptable. These kids can get bullied, um, can be very anxious in social mm -hmm. settings, right, because they just, they, they walk onto a playground and all they see is chaos. So they don't understand what's the game and how do I fit in and what are the rules and what am I supposed to do. Um, so let's see, they can seem selfish um, and very often they sort of talk at you. So they're not really having back and forth conversation. They're not asking you how your weekend was. They're just telling you mm -hmm. what they did that was really exciting or that they really didn't like. Okay. Okay. okay, so over and over again, what we've talked about is trying to understand what are the triggers for the behavior so that we can understand the why of the behavior um, and understand how those around the child respond to the behavior, right? So we sort of morphed from your typically developing child who has little sort of perturbations in their challenging behavior into more challenging areas of kids that really have repeated patterns and maybe you're seeking professional help or maybe the school is putting some services <coughs> together for your child. And you're really looking at not just the antecedents, and we did an assignment doing this, not just the antecedents leading up to this behavior and describing their behavior, but how are we responding? Because as anybody who does this, knows very often we, the other people around the child, are a part of the problem. So the problem behavior is probably serving it, serving a purpose for the child. It is probably getting them out of something that they don't want to do. It's probably getting them access to the food that they are craving um, or the attention that they're wanting. So there's a function for the behavior, which is why the behavior occur keeps recurring. And I know a lot of parents just don't get that. It, it must just be that I need to be firmer, that I need to punish them more. Why is this behavior continuing? So it's not just understanding the why of the behavior and what the behavior actually is, but it's how are we going to make modifications around this child so we are not inadvertently reinforcing this. Right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Did you learn anything from your exercise over the week about the C's, the consequences? Mm -hmm. I mean, you thought about your consequence. And um, and therefore you are better able to manage um, that. But in terms of trends, anybody thinking about their consequences and how they're a part of the cycles they're observing? Well, sometimes it becomes a motivation to go back and continue with that behavior. Um, yeah. For example, uh, well, um, I had a parent who came in and was saying that her son uh, was acting um, out constantly in the classroom to the point where he was sent to the principal's office and then the school started calling her and saying, come pick up your child. And she finally <laughs> said, no, sorry, I'm not doing it. You are the professionals. Deal with it. Because what was happening was he was a smart kid. He said, oh, oh I, can go home. I can spend time with mommy. And I don't have to do and, all the... And I don't have to do that reading yeah. assignment. So... So, you know, and they had to break that and because the consequence for the behavior was ultimately feeding into the perpetuation of the bad behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, 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 you know, I, can, can I just comment that on, yeah. on, on the consequences, a lot of times what you can learn from the consequences, if you've done things to help them calm down mm -hmm. and they calm down, You've also reinforced whatever they just did. Yeah. Take that mm -hmm. and build it into the mm -hmm. schedule so they're getting it before right. exactly. they lose it. Exactly. You know, so if someone, if you end up sitting down having a cup of tea in a long discussion mm -hmm. after someone has a meltdown, think about having a tea time mm -hmm. before that happens. And that that is so important. Mm -hmm. And the time <clears throat> that 
being a problem is this whole world of sensory processing yeah. disorders. So we're thinking of triggers for our child and that our child needs these kinds of sensory, the sensory diet that the occupational mm -hmm. therapists talk about. And that's the reason for the behavior. So very often what someone will do is the child's acting out because they need to rock mm -hmm. or whatever, or they need to go on the swing. So the child acts out and you put them on the swing. Well, guess what? you are now reinforcing it. Mm -hmm. So the time where it's really helpful <coughs> to use a sensory mm -hmm. diet, if we're going to call it, is before the demand, right? If a child needs to swing to get regulated, to, to get calm, and to be able to meet a demand, then you do it beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that might be true for what you were talking about, Maria, too. You know, if your child really needs the attention because he's just exhausted and falling apart and I need you to stay regulated, then let's do that first and then he can go do something on his own while you're doing whatever, so rather than being the reinforcer to the behavior you're trying to get rid of. I totally get it. But so, so back to my example with food. So tantrum, and I'm like, oh, yeah, and then he has to eat at his dinner time. He's getting the reinforcer. He jumped, and he got the food. So I tried to calm him down and create a space, but it, I don't think it's never good enough space. For okay, so say. now we're going to talk yeah. into... We're going to morph into talking about how do we set goals for our kid. Okay. And this idea of collaborative problem solving is the way we're going to do that with an older child, a child that has one language. And so the, the caveat here is that with younger kids, you're going to either offer them choices or you're just going to be thinking about what are the things that he could do during that difficult time that are constructive that are getting us towards our end goal. So if it's, say, jumping on his trampoline for five minutes, that's a good way, and, you know, it's close by, that's a good way for him to deal with the, the, the excitement he has about dinner coming, and I've set a timer, so I've made it very concrete how long this period is going to be. Then you decide, say you, just, you come up with trampoline is it, then you have a visual for, okay, now we're transitioning into before dinner time, and this is how long it's going to be, okay. and I want you to do this for this period of time and pick a time that is reasonable for him to do it on his own, right? So it might not be trampoline with him, but it might be something that's frenetic and, and sensory based, and then when he does that, he gets in some way rewarded. It might be by coming in and being able to eat, or it might be a token system or praise or whatever. But you're setting a goal. You, you figured out what his trigger is, and you figured out how you don't want to be a reward for his acting out behavior. So you don't want to feed him when he's acting out. <laughs> so you've got to set a goal that's reasonable. So it's not going to be sitting down and quietly working, but it might be something that's that's a motor kind of activity, right? So with an older child, you're going to go through something that um, this comes from Ross Green book called Explosive Child, or his website, which is free and wonderful, Lives in the Balance. Um, this process of working with your child and teaching, modeling and teaching, problem solving, so that you two can together um, set up some goals and, um, and practice achieving them. So through this process of collaboration, we're using empathy first to strengthen the relationship, and we've talked about that over and over again. So you're affirming however your child's feeling, right? So you're not just automatically setting up a further conflict um, by saying, no, you can't have that cookie. You're saying, oh, I know you love cookies, um, but we have a problem, right? And through this process, we're going to collect information about their perspective, assuming they have enough language to do this. Um, we're going to state the problem or the dilemma. Because the dilemma with the cookies is, I know it's not good for your heart. I know you need to, if I give you a cookie now, you're not going to eat the healthy foods I'm going to give you later. So I have this problem because as a parent, it's my job to raise you healthy. And I know I can't give you cookies whenever you need to. So that's a dilemma. That's a very neutral dilemma, and it's always good to have an outside source that tells you why it's a dilemma, right? So the pediatrician says, or whatever, Dr. Spock says, um, state the problem, and then what you're going to do is you're going to brainstorm together, and again, it depends on your child's developmental level, but your child's going to grow with this. 
And this, you're going to brainstorm together to not only share their view and state your dilemma, but to um, come up with a mutually satisfactory um, solution. And this is not a one-time thing. So you might come up with a solution that seems totally ludicrous to you, but it sort of meets your needs for a start. And then you're going to watch what happens um, over the course of the week, and together you're going to sit down at another time. You're always doing collaborative problem solving when everybody's calm, right? We're not doing it during the moment. I've said that over and over again. So you might do it during a family meeting. You might have a regular time, or you just do it in the car, or you, you do it sometime where everybody's calm. Um, so we're going to set these goals together, and we're going to observe over the next period of time, is this working? Is this satisfying your needs? Is this satisfying my needs? And are we being successful? Okay, if not, maybe we need to set some different goals. So it's an ongoing process. And on his website, um, when I have more time in these parenting classes, I give some vignettes because he has a lot of vignettes on his website which are really helpful because it seems very simple but actually can be difficult um, with some kids to, to go through this process. So again, a more authoritative, imposing your will kind of approach is going to make things worse. Um, and teaching problem solve, solving is going to focus on what you want to see. Okay, so um, just to give you a little bit more details about brainstorming is this is what it looks like. And again, it's an older child with good verbal skills. You're sitting down and you've decided, okay, so I'm making it at 2 o'clock. You and I are going to have a review of um, the problems we've been having um, every time you ask for a cookie. And we're going to sit down, and um, I'm going to start by saying, you know, Johnny, I, I, I've noticed that that um, every time such and such happens, you want a cookie, and you get really upset when you can't have a cookie. Um, and I know this is really hard for you because you love cookies, um, but we have a problem here. So you're going to go from this empathetic description of what you're seeing, and notice I'm using very objective terms. I'm not saying it really makes me angry, or how come you, or are you always triggering such and such. You're just describing a very objective, neutral kind of terms. You're um, affirming the way he's feeling, and you're defining what the problem is. But I have this problem because it's my job to raise a, a healthy child. Um, and blah, 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 this is a dilemma. So can you tell me more about what, what's, why you get so upset? Tell me more about it, or share with me what do you think is happening. Now, with many kids, they can't do that, um, and you might need to probe a little bit. Um, so it's it's really, his technique, he says six and above, I really think it's probably eight, maybe nine or ten, depending on the kid. Um, but, but it's a precedent that you're setting for a lifetime, um, and this invitation step might not be, you might not be successful with initially, but if you guys have teenagers, I would definitely recommend it. And he has some really powerful videos of teenagers um, with conflicts that they're having with kids, where once they share their view of what's happening, you suddenly recognize that there are so many other reasons why this behavior is occurring, and you have to include some problem solving for the bigger issues. So, you know, this child's being provoked by somebody else, or there's, he's coming to school with, with um, anger based on some family issues, or he's not getting enough sleep, or who knows. But we have to hear the child's view um, to, um, to encourage this collaboration of us working together, and also to really address the problem. So if your child's not able to do this verbally, you're hopefully doing this by collecting your ABCs. Um, but as the child gets older, we want them to participate in this process. And then, so this is just more details on what some lines of what the empathy step might look like. So you're not going to judge. Maybe allowing for sighting is okay. Um, back. Um, don't rush through it. Sitting, Ross Green talks over and over again, but sometimes you just want to sit there in silence because the child might actually be thinking or it might be a hard process. And you could say something like, oh, I can see you're really thinking 
about this. I love to say that to kids. I see you're working really, really hard. So then it's not as awkward because at least you've commented on it and that might actually bring them back to the table, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And just realize that anything the child says is legitimate, even mm -hmm. if it seems totally mm -hmm. inane. Um, but you're encouraging this process. The next step is defining a problem, okay? And a again, having some language sort of stored. The thing is, Johnny, I have this problem, right? Um, so talking about what the problem is and how we have different needs and expectations and then moving on to the invitation. Uh -huh. um, with, with the younger kids or kids who uh, haven't got a lot of expressive language in particular, um, narratives and finding the right book and those kinds of things can be really helpful so that they can actually, it's sometimes easier for them to focus on someone else dealing with this situation, but it is for, to focus on them dealing with the situation, and then you can make the bridge. Yeah. Comment. Yeah, so those kinds of kids we talked about earlier that might have um, deficiencies in their ability to talk about this or to uh, lacking self-awareness or lacking social awareness, you want to teach it through either modeling, sharing your observations out in the world. There's all sorts of great literature. Um, there's some great cartoons. Um, but thinking about what's going to motivate the child or using something like a social story. Okay, we're going to create a story about this particular child and the kind of dilemmas they have to offer some, um, some options for them. And I've done that before with sort of an intermediate age child, like a six-year-old, where you make a social story and then you have these areas that a child can control. Like I once had this child who just absolutely refused to get in the bath and wash her hair. So we had these like blanks in the social story and then we had several options and every Sunday they would sit down and she would pick out what soap she used and which two days a week she would have a bath and what her shampoo was and that gave her the sense of control over the situation and she would do it for the week and she was much more compliant. So rather than bathing and washing her hair every day, we backed off to, to what was minimally acceptable for that family and we gave the child some control by allowing her some options. And then we had that visual, so they would read through the social stories. So social stories can be really helpful. These are common stumbling blocks. It can be really awkward. Um, and again, look at his videos because they're really helpful. And just practicing this reflective language can be so helpful with all of our kids. If you haven't read the book that's also on my bibliography called How Do You Talk So Your Child Will Listen and How Do You Listen So Your Child Will Talk? You know that book by Maslish? It's wonderful. Um, it's good for spouses, too. Uh, <laughs> All of these strategies are good for relationships. Actually, you have to do this with yourself. If your kid is having a yeah. meltdown, you have to do yeah. this with yourself yeah. Yeah. so that you can be calm enough. One thing I learned early on, I did a lot of crisis management, you have to come in calm. Mm -hmm. If you come yeah. in upset, mm -hmm. it's going to get worse, not better. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. And, that, and that's that's the most challenging piece for some parents, especially if they also have some executive functioning issues and stuff. You really act. Most behavior plans actually are focused on the people who support the child, not on the child directly. It's like, what do you need? To, you need to step away first, breathe, and then come back. But I know you've said that. But yeah, and and critically important. And who gets training for this? I mean, do teachers get training for it? It's part of their continuing education, but. Most teachers yeah, don't have you know, training. My husband was having a shouting match with my daughter over like brushing her teeth, and I'm like, and she was shouting and he was shouting. I'm like, okay, she's modeling your behavior, and then right. and then he tells her he's like, stop screaming. And I'm like, but you're screaming yourself. Mm -hmm. What are you going to learn from you? Yeah. Right. And I was like, it's time for you to walk away. You know, sometimes like mommy needs a timeout. Sometimes daddy needs a timeout. Yeah. You know, when it gets too heated. Yeah. Well, if you think of one of the caregivers, because you know, we see a child. My husband sees Camilo. Less than one hour a day on a weekday. Yeah. Yeah. So it is like that can be good and bad. Okay. But but the thing is, um, many times he's with a caregiver and they switch for different reasons. Pregnancy is the reason she mm -hmm. just left. Have a new person. I'm dealing with a person that goes like every two seconds. No, 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 no. I'm like, do I want to find a new person? Do I want a trainer? And it's gonna be a long time to train this person. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot 
for the parent who is trying to be educated to educate yeah. others. And yeah. 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 And this is where visuals can be so helpful, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Because then you can, whether it's a book or a chart or whatever, you can sort of hand it over. Um, yeah. So when we're talking about establishing goals, you want to write them down. You want the child to own them. And I like with young kids, I like the child to be a part of writing them down. Mm -hmm. So maybe you just made cards or things that the child's pasting or coloring or gluing or whatever, but you want your child to own it mm -hmm. so that when you get to that moment and you say, oh, it's almost dinner time. We have five more minutes. What are you going to do? Oh, yeah, let's go to our chart. You're going to go on the trampoline. Let's set the timer. And hopefully what you're working towards is the child taking responsibility for all of that. And then you know you've been successful. And then you're going to have cooperation because the, all of our kids, we said this from the beginning, all of our kids want to be successful and efficacious, mm -hmm. right? And they feel really good about that. So that's the last step here. In we talked about how you want to be planning ahead for these times where you're expecting um, there to be a problem where you have to have concrete goals. And this is my other little soapbox that I'll get on is that Many people use these behavioral systems, and hopefully George is not going to scold me, use these behavioral systems where everybody comes in and everybody's good, right? And as soon as a child starts seeing something that's not acceptable, they get demoted, so to speak. You flip the card or they go from green to yellow. Or, um, so it's like saying no, no, no. It's like saying you're being bad. And all kids, when you ask them, they say, when I'm bad, I go from green to yellow, <laughs> right? It's not when I call out in class. It's when I'm bad. So how does that feel? So setting down goals is having reasonable expectations so we can start out with success and building on them and encouraging our child. And that is not going into a classroom where you get scolded or demoted um, for every time you do something that is a result of your disability or just your, your temperament type. Yeah, and publicly demoted. Mm -hmm. I, I think sometimes it's not understood yes. that you. when you do something publicly, it's an entire different thing than when yes. you pull yes. someone aside and talk to them. Right. Right. Public humiliation. Okay. Having time to revisit. And then you might want to use incentives. And I forget where, where I put this. Um, so I wanted to give you some examples of, without going into specifics, the idea of incentive programs um, and highlight a couple issues. One is, if you are using one of these kinds of token economies or incentive programs um, where a child is earning points towards some larger kind of motivating activity, those motivators have to be motivating to the child, number one. So that doesn't mean you've decided what the motivation is. You know they work for your child. Hopefully they are not, they don't involve money unless it's an older child who really needs money and you're working towards that. And hopefully it doesn't involve things that you're buying because they think it's the wrong values to be teaching your child. So hopefully the rewards are related to values we're trying to teach our children. Time together, special time they get to spend. Um, I think electronics should only be Again, one of my soapboxes. I don't think young children should just have ready access to these things. Mm -hmm. We buy them. They're expensive now, um, and we have month monthly costs involved. And um, especially if you have a child with difficulties, this is a fantastic motivator. So it has to be something that's motivating to the child and that they don't uh, already have easy access to. So if you're going to use an electronic and there's some game they love, they can only earn that game. They can't play that game at other times. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's not going to work. I just comment. Yeah, I, I, I I've learned over, you to comment over here. time is that things that a child really, or an adult, really craves are usually not the best reinforcers. So if you have a kid who where the problems are around electronics and they really crave electronics, you're better off right. putting it on your schedule and setting firm limits rather than trying to use it as a reinforcer. Very good point. So what would be a reinforcer? Then? Because otherwise what happens is... So like in your case, you would not want to use food. Oh, no, no. Right? Yeah. So she has issues no. around he craves food all the time. So 
um, you wouldn't want to use food yeah. in John Dennis. Right, because right, when they don't get it, you actually cause a meltdown, yeah, and right. you don't want to do right. that. Yeah, you're so. right. You're right. Yeah. Um, so again, just to go through some specifics about um, token economies, there are many, many, many different ways to do this. And I usually say to parents, because I'm very informal, I'm not a behaviorist, and if they need a formal plan, I'm sending them to someone like George. But sometimes just making a little grid on a piece of paper and defining what the behavior is you want to see in the child. And every time, and I did this with a kid in the office, and the parent was flabbergasted how effective it can be, at least initially. Every time the child exhibited the behavior that we were working on, he got a check or a sticker on the chart, and when it's filled in, then you get to cash this in for something bigger. Um, that's a simple, informal way to do it. If you're doing it regularly, you probably want to be a little bit more systematic, like thinking about how many times is the behavior likely to occur, how many checks is the child likely to, to earn, do we want to have like differential re uh, reinforcements for different amounts of checks, those kinds of things, and that's when you're hiring somebody to help you with that. So you might use just poker chips, um, mm -hmm. just to be informal, you know, pull them from your poker game or pull them from a game that you might have if an older older child, there might be different um, values placed. The red one is five points, the green one is ten points, that kind of thing. Um, but you want to have a system, again, that the child understands, um, and you want to be specific about it. So the other mistake I see parents doing all the time is reinforcing good behavior. Right? What is that? Well, we decided right from the beginning of this class that all of our kids are good. And that's one of the first things I say to kids with problem behaviors. I differentiate. When I ask them what happens in school um, when you such and such behavior occurs, you know, I get in trouble, and, and why is that? Well, every time I'm bad, this is what happens, and when I'm good, this is when I'm happy, uh, what happens. And kids internalize it because we use that kind of language just because it slips out of our mouth. So it's really important to be very objective about what we're working on and reinforcing that objective behavior and not our kids being good. So just to clarify, you don't want us to say the word good behavior. You just wanted to say, oh, you wash your hands after using the potty. Yeah, so and you want to define it okay. after how many times. Okay. I only asked you once, and it was within. And not relate that to, oh, that's good or not good. Just right. don't use those. Try okay. not to okay. use okay. good and bad. Okay. And certainly we're not setting up a token economy for good behavior, right. which is what happens in school. So, mm -hmm. so even when I see right, in right, school right, right. that kids are on these systems where they get reinforced for on, I, I call it on-task behavior. Mm -hmm. It's from their lingo. Um, so when the kids are doing what we want them to do, they'll get reinforced, but it's good, right? And you'll see like the little index at the bottom, yellow means good and blue means bad. Um, so again, we want to be, we want to define the behavior that we're working on because the child's sitting there saying, not really thinking this way, but um, the child wants to be good. So they're sitting there trying to be good, but they don't know what it is that they're supposed to be doing because they're impulsive or they're lacking in awareness or whatever. Oh, you want me to raise my hand and wait until you call on me. Okay, so now I'm working on that. So every time I raise my hand and wait until I'm called on, I'm going to get a point. Oh, I get that. Now I'm going to try really, really hard. And first, the teacher's going to call on them pretty quickly and not make them wait too long. But then over time, she's going to make him wait longer and longer, so he's practicing that. So he's got all of his attention focused on this skill acquisition, and is really motivated because there's this incentive. If I do this so many times, then when I get home, this is what I'm going to get to do. So just don't call it good behavior. Right. Okay. It's really hard to yeah. avoid doing that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I, I think the words good job or often good job doing this but you have to specify yeah, what it is yeah. what it is you're reinforced some kids will you know have picked their nose and then done something you like and you say hey great job and <laughs> and honestly you don't know what you're reinforcing <laughs> because it's not reinforcement isn't always a conscious but you're picking your battles <laughs> Okay, so is that clear? Yeah. You know, when we talked again about the ABCs and you're defining that behavior in objective, very concrete language so that I know exactly what you're talking about, that's the same way for these behavioral systems, setting goals. I want you to raise your hand and wait to speak until the teacher calls on you. Since we're kind of talking, you said before when you have the, the charts with behaviors, 
if the kid is not doing that, then you don't take away tokens, but then you try to redirect. Like, I remember a person saying, what are we working for? And kind of like reminding my kids, this is what I expect you to do. Is, is that what I should be doing? Or? So you want to start by reinforcing. You want to get the system going. You want it to be successful. Um, but very often, and, and you know, again, this is when I defer to the behaviorists, but many times as you're getting into a system and it's working and you're starting to expand your successes, then you're going to work on the system where you take tokens away for problem behaviors. So if you've made a poor choice, if you've accessed something that we're working towards avoiding, then you might take those tokens away. But if you're trying to get compliance with this new system, you want it to work. You have to be successful first. Mm -hmm. So you can't expect the moon, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say t when taking things away, if that's an antecedent to meltdown behavior, then it's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. Some kids can tolerate it, some kids can't, and you can actually work up so they can better tolerate it because our mm -hmm. world is that way. But um, So you see from all these comments, especially George's comments, that there is not one way to do these things. Right. And that really is individualized and it takes and this is why when schools do an FBA, a functional behavior assessment, or you call in a specialist, it takes a lot of time to observe these patterns mm -hmm. to really understand what's the best way to put a behavior plan together. And that's why my course is not directing you so when you go home you're going to know how to do all this on your own. It's just giving you ideas. But in fact, when you're doing this for kids that have significant behavioral challenges, you need to call in a professional. You're going to need more help. Okay, so I think we've talked about, uh, I love this idea of just sporadically giving bonus points. That's not necessarily for a token system, but that's also just for raising your child. Sporadically, because actually very often, and there's been research that said that, that um, what's the term? Intermittent reinforcers. Intermittent reinforcers. See, they have their own language. Intermittent reinforcers. That's to keep other people out of this, you know? I know. Okay. I know. <laughs> so we'll talk about tax and whatever. Anyway, um, uh, we'll sort of race through this, but you'll have this information talking about um, a token economy. This is the kind of thing that um, behaviorists might put together for a younger child where you're working towards, okay, here's the picture of what you're working towards. So this is probably a physical thing that's sitting on their desk in school or sitting with you at home. Um, and you're going to earn points, so you might have a little pocket with a little Velcro points, and this is a picture of what you're working towards, and the child can visually see how many more. So in, uh, with a young child or a child at a, at a more rudimentary developmental level, you might just have four or five. But as you get older, you can make these systems um, more complex. How early can you use this, like in terms of age? How early? Uh-huh. Can you fit in the toddlers? Or oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Okay. So, um, again, it needs to be individualized, and sometimes a younger child needs to have an immediate reinforcer. But once they understand, so if you start out using a system like this with maybe just two, or maybe even first then, that's usually we start with, mm -hmm. you do this, <coughs> you get um, a, a desired outcome, then you can sort of morph into having more tokens before you get the, the consequence. Okay. I just wanted to give you some visuals for what these things look like. I don't know why this slide never comes out, and I apologize. It, in your printed copy, hopefully it looks good. Yeah, it's it is. Yeah, it is. Okay. Uh -huh. I, oh, it, it, every time I give a talk, this happens. So you see what it's supposed to look like? Yeah. This is something I use, like, for typical ADHD kind of kid where I'm trying to get some pseudo objective measure of the challenging behaviors. So um, it's something that a teacher, so there should be lots of columns, that a teacher can fill in every day and it'll take her 30 seconds a minute. And you come up with, you the parent and the teacher come up with five or six behavioral target goals that you're working on, and especially if I'm prescribing medications, I'll use this, and I'm thinking about things that are likely to be affected by the medication, right? So if it's a child who blurts out, it might be waiting um, until he's called on, um, that kind of thing. So I have some very specific objective behavioral goals. The teacher can rate the child. As a child gets older, the child can rate themselves and have a discussion with the teacher and you can compare and contrast and that's a great lesson in and of itself. Um, but this is a nice goal um, for
for uh, some sort of um, data collection at school before you've gotten to a higher level of functional behavior assessment where they're really collecting. But that actually um, works data. very well with a token system where you're, what you reward is yeah. an average number of points. Yeah. <laughs> because I think we're about to leave the token systems. Is just one last point is that this is a working document and it should change. Either the goals should change or the reinforcers should be faded. Otherwise, you create a dependence mm -hmm. and a rigidity right. over a system, and you, when, when it doesn't go right, you start getting meltdowns over those kinds of problems. And parents like. so often say, I've tried that, it didn't work. Right. For that reason, because it's not as mm. easy as it sounds. It's not. It's not. Yeah, we've gotten through the bulk of it. I was just going to do cases. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Um, so, yeah, you have to change it out. You have to look at what's working, what isn't working. Um, and it's not going to be a, a, a one stop. Okay, so these are just some other visuals that I wasn't going to talk about. I think I wanted to um, throw out some cases and have you guys think about, yeah, think about how you might address them. And we have 15 more minutes. Okay, so I'll do a couple of cases. Oh, to 11, so we're in our bonus area. Right? <gasps> oh my gosh. I was thinking 11.30. We're way over. Okay. I thought it was 11.30. Nope. Oh, that's why she left. Oh, I'm really sorry. I was thinking 11. I don't know why. Um, I'll give you one case and... Um, we can keep going. Yeah. <laughs> so um, here's a case actually that was came in my office last week. It's a, a very concrete kind of issue, but this is an eight-year-old. He actually has a diagnosis of autism, but that's irrelevant. He's just a very concrete, literal thinker. He's lots of language, adorable kid. Um, and mostly he's pretty well regulated, but when he's challenged, that's when um, he uh, becomes, um, he melts down and he can become very challenging. So the dilemma that they brought to me, he came in with his mom. His mom was wearing boots. And I went to meet them, as I always do, out in the waiting room. And I saw this kid, and he was like this. He was so mad. And her boots had marks all over them. And she said, I just wanted you to see. <laughs> so they come into my office. And this is a kid who's always so excited to see me. He writes, I love you, Dr. Panis. <laughs> and he was just furious. So I said, OK, what's going on? And he, he was too mad. He couldn't tell me. She said, OK, I'm going to tell you. He does not like it when I wear boots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and every time I put my boots on, she loves her boots. And she said, you know, I really want to get a black pair. Um, but her, she's got marks all over his boots because he's been stomping on her boots. Every time I put boots on, he loses it. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you're kidding. Mm -hmm. And, of course, she's been handling it by saying, I like boots, and I'm going to wear them, and you have to deal with it, right? Mm -hmm. She's a wonderful mom, but she feels he has to learn how to be able to accept these kinds mm -hmm. of things sure. and that other people have other kinds of desires. So I said to him, okay, Johnny, I can tell you're having a really bad day. What's going on? She shouldn't be wearing boots. I hate it when she wears boots. <laughs> and I said, wow. You have really strong feelings about this, don't you? So we went on to talk without belaboring it too much. It turns out that he said she should not wear boots after February 8th. <laughs> and I said, oh, maybe it was the 9th. I can't remember which day. <laughs> and I said, really? And this was just a week ago. And I said, oh, she shouldn't? Why is that? Because it's Groundhog Day and winter's over on February 8th. So in this kid's mind, <laughs> winter was over and the boots should go away. It's about the rigidity, really. It was yeah. about the rigidity. And also, I said to him, now wait a minute. When is winter over? And he said, February 8th. And I said, well, let's ask Siri when winter's over. And so we did that. And, um, and I said to the mom, are you okay giving up your boots after March 20th? And she said, yeah, I am. So we sat there and we redefined when winter is, which satisfied him. And we sat down and we took like the Ross Green method of, this is a very simple kind of case, of, okay, mom, how many days would you like to wear your boots? She said five. And he said, no, never. And I said, okay, well, how about two? And she said, no, that's not enough. How about three? And I said, okay, until March 21st, well, through March 20th, mom's going to wear her boots three times a day. And can you handle that? 
And he said, as long as she stops till March 20th. Now, I haven't heard. Wow. <laughs> but we sat there. No, he's counting. <laughs> but yeah. he's and I said to mom, him. don't buy a second pair of boots yet. You know, maybe that's for next winter. But they had to have some success. And that's how literal and concrete he was. So, the, of course, most problems you can't solve that well. But it was just such a great case I had to share. Can, can I add to Yeah. That? So my kid is like that with me. He yeah. doesn't care about other people. I haven't worn any jewelry since he was born. First, because he was a baby and grabbing everything. I thought it was going to be over. Now it's worse. I'm wearing gla um, earrings, and he drives him crazy. Off, ear off, ear off, ear off. I'm like, okay, stop. Um, glasses, I had to wear them because I don't see a thing anymore. I had to teach him, and I said, like, I need to wear this and to wear this. And Sorry, I felt like he gave up. But um, the ears, I haven't used it because I feel like, in the time I'm teaching him, he's going to pull them, and then I'm going to have a problem. Uh -huh. So I'm like, that's when I'm telling you I'm a little relaxed. I'm like, who cares? I don't need earrings. Sometimes I feel like I do, but I can live without it. Um, I pick my bottles, but it's interesting to see how rigid he can be with some things, and then we can be in a plane 17 hours, and he's sleeping in a very different pattern, and he's fine. So it's, yeah. it's hard to define a child when you were saying, is he rigid? It's like... Yeah, it's so hard to define. And we can't mm -hmm. can't figure it out through words, so it might just be a matter of exposing him. Right. So pointing out who's wearing jewelry, having a doll that you dress with jewelry, looking at books about jewelry, and comparing him. Okay, mommy's going to wear earrings today for an hour, and and just start as you would we call yeah. that exposure therapy for kids that have aversions right. to certain things. Right. So to start getting him used to it. Only because at some point you want to wear your jewelry, oh, yeah. and he's okay with other people. <laughs> uh -huh. Other people. Mm -hmm. This is a moment. I, I, thing. I feel special, but yeah, sometimes I'm like, ah, I could yeah. use something. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's interesting how they. And I'm sure if I could read his mind, he would be internalizing all of that, mm -hmm. or, or or he's thinking of all of that. I just I just don't know. Yeah. Maybe you could make yeah. some jewelry together, and you could both wear it. I mean, there are ways of just making it fun. And let him way. pick which jewelry. You could earrings, now uh, help me pick, pick out some earrings. Yeah, yeah. Keith could take him shopping. Because I saw it with the glasses. You have to be really slow. Like, okay, 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. oh. and yeah. now he doesn't mind. But yeah. Um, my question has to do with building flexibility uh, for a kid. Um, so because, you know, you can do all sorts of things, preparing a child for something, you know, with the social stories, the visual schedules, talking about it, you know, the whole thing. And that can really help tremendously in day-to-day in -day stuff. But life happens. Things happen. And suddenly you have not had the opportunity to prepare them for something. And then they have a meltdown. Um, you know, for example, uh, the parent doesn't, get the email that the, the, school, the particular school has been closed because the air conditioning doesn't work. And all the other schools are still open, but that one's closed, and they're waiting for the bus to pick them up, and you know, then they call the bus and say, oh, you know, that school's closed. You have to tell the kids, sorry, no school today. The kid has a complete and total right. meltdown. Right, because you can't always prepare you them. You can't for always happens. prepare. So what are some things that are helpful to well, build you know, flexibility. Taking that apart after the fact mm -hmm. and talking about the very issue, mm -hmm. assuming that child has enough language, um, cer certainly self-calming. Mm -hmm. if, if it's a child, you can't work it through. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's like everything. So we accommodate, we accommodate so that a child can be successful, but then we also have to introduce unpredictability. So uh -huh. we have to actually work on mm -hmm. unpredictability. Mm -hmm. And just introducing that into every day, mm -hmm. and so you talk. This is the unstuck and on target mm -hmm. curriculum, mm -hmm. and you you set up a whole metaphor for what flexibility is. Mm -hmm. You know, they teach it very concretely. Mm -hmm. This is what it means to be flexible. Okay, now we're going to practice it. And you say to the child as it's happening, and you see them sort of mounting. Mm -hmm. Remember, we're working on flexibility. Mm -hmm. And then again, they have a sense of empowerment because mm -hmm. I know I can do this, and this is what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. There's some language to describe it, mm -hmm. and I have some positive experiences mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's always a problem because when we have young kids that are very rigid, what do we do? We make life predictable. We use all these strategies sure. I've talked yeah. about. We, we prepare them, but then we have to morph into preparing them for life, and you have to deal mm -hmm. with spontaneity, mm -hmm. and that's hard, okay. but it's a transition. I think a lot of what you said about problem solving mm -hmm. also, if you can get them to shift 
from when the world goes wrong, you blow up, to when the world goes ro- goes wrong, you figure out how to fix it. Right, right. And, and it's almost an, an attitude or orientation right. that, that actually can be changed. Mm-hmm. It takes a while. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just want to say before your, your comments, and maybe you're going to turn off um, the recorder, because there were specific questions, mm-hmm. and I was going to sort of create case scenarios, but I just want to see, because... Um, Two people asked about two problems. One was a two-year-old with challenging behaviors at the dinner table and poor weight gain, and every time the child acts out, they put the child in time out, and what are they supposed to do? Um, so this is an example of, um, a, a, of a very complicated kind of behavior, and you need a professional involved, because when you're failing to gain weight, um, that could be attributable to other kinds of issues, whether they're medical or more significant behavioral problems, um, and, um, and this is a consequence that it's not helping you. So this is a really good example of how timeouts are not teaching your child new skills, and you need to break down what the skills are. Also, eating and toileting are so emotionally laden, so there are so many other psychologic and, and family dynamic kinds of issues that go into challenging eating behaviors. So there's not a one way to fix this, um, and there are cultural reasons, there are personal reasons um, about how you feel about the dinner table, but timeouts are not going to be appropriate for a child who's failing to gain weight and exhibiting challenging behaviors. You might want to work on something very concrete. I usually start with just sitting. If you have an active child um, and it's difficult for them to sit, you might want to just work on sitting, and you can do that in an easy way, and that might help you get started, but um, looking at the eating behavior probably requires a specialist and we can't quickly address that. And the other one um, uh, was a good example of of twins and they have very different personalities and one is the leader and one's the follower and how does she manage that um, as a parent with these two kids? Well, every day and every interaction is an opportunity for teaching each child certain behaviors. Um, So you might reinforce helping behaviors, you might reinforce um, acts of kindness. Um, With both kids, there are going to be different goals, um, but you can find teaching opportunities within these challenging interactions, peer interactions, as you would with any two two children. So um, that's actually an advantage, because if we had two carbon copies for our kids, um, there, there wouldn't be conflict. And our kids are learning social skills at home. So she's actually sort of lucky that she has two very different personalities and she can teach each of these kids how to deal with those opposite personalities and that will serve them better out in the community. Okay, so timeouts are not going to solve your problems. It's teaching skills, finding opportunities, being very concrete, figuring out what is a successful motivator, how to reinforce these things, and calling on an expert when you need them. So there's some... Um, uh, my favorite books here, and um, I wish you all the best. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very wonderful. I have a quick question. When you said that you don't want to solve the problem when it happens, but you also said something I do, so I want to make sure I understand. Like if the child is having a crisis and you come, oh, what happened? Here, let me. And you said not to do that? Yeah. If you have no idea what happened, why is it? What, what so is it I'm not talking about a single isolated instance. I'm talking about recurring problem behavior. Okay, so, so you know course, what happened. Yeah, so of course okay. there are going to be times where you have to figure it out. Your child right. is hurt or is upset. Right, right, right. Okay. I just didn't get that. Okay. I but if you know what happened. Thank you to everybody online for coming. I'm going to go ahead and end the recording, okay. and this will be sent out to anybody who is registered and then put on our YouTube channel for permanent listening. Thank you.